It's one of the richest countries on earth, caught in an economic crisis. It's not possible that Mexicans will tolerate this situation much longer. By mere logic, it must be resolved, or it will explode. Better that it be resolved. What are Mexicans doing to put the pieces back together? Emerging Powers is made possible by the Ford Motor Company, where quality is job one. Emerging Powers is supported by IBM. With additional funding provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the annual financial support of viewers like you. Hello, I'm Consuelo Mack of the Wall Street Journal. Beyond New York Harbor, there's a whole group of countries that used to be defined as third world. Now they are beginning to shake that label and become economic powers in their own right. In the next hour, we're going to take a look at Mexico, America's third largest trading partner. Mexico was considered to be the star among emerging markets until December of 1994, when the Mexican peso suffered a dramatic drop in value. Since then, the country has been gripped by a painful recession. Such crises are not unusual in rapidly developing countries. Our own economy went through dramatic swings in the 19th century before achieving its level as a great economic power. There are many who believe that the same will be true of Mexico in the 21st century, that in spite of its troubles, this country of nearly 100 million can't be counted out. Mexico has too much going for it in the wealth of its resources, the sophistication of its technology, the talents and the determination of its people. Night at 10, the Mexico City newspaper Reforma goes to press. It's a young paper, just two years in publication. But in that short time, Reforma has established a solid reputation for sound reporting. Business correspondent Rosana Fuentes has a journalism degree from the University of Southern California. She worked in the New York Bureau of the Mexican Government News Agency, then for the newspaper El Financiero, before joining Reforma. My newspaper was founded in 1993. We have a goal, to bring independence and critical focus to Mexican journalism. We try to give our readers a balanced account of the news. No easy task anywhere, especially in my field, business and economics. It's hard to separate emotion from fact or expectations from reality. But anyone who was born in Mexico, like myself, has had to learn how to live with complexity. At the center of Mexican political, economic, religious and cultural life is the central square the Zócalo. On this Zócalo, the Aztec Emperor Moctezuma once ruled over Mexico Tenochtitlan, the place of the eagle, the serpent and the cactus. The conquering Spaniards built their government here, on top of the Aztec temple they destroyed. They named their colony New Spain, but it was never quite that the indigenous people of Tenochtitlan remained and made their cultures part of the new Mexico. We 
we became one nation, encompassing many ways of life and many identities. We're still a third world country, but we're already the 13th largest economy in the world. In Latin America, only Brazil outranks Mexico in wealth and population. one of the oldest cultures in the world, and the youngest. Over half of our population is under 20. Every year, more than one million of them go looking for their first job. We're a major exporter to the United States, the largest market in the world, though our economy is just a fraction of its size. We're a poor country. Traditional industries still support a third of our people. Yet, we produce more corn than India, more beer than Australia, more glass than Austria, more steel than Sweden, more oil than the United Arab Emirates, and more billionaires than Germany. The contradictions in our culture define us. And there is no bigger contradiction than the gap between our economic potential and the economic crisis we're now enduring. Just a few years ago, it seemed that we were going to enjoy, as a nation, greater prosperity and greater political freedom. In short, become a full-fledged member of the First World. Indeed, these were the exact words that former President Carlos Salinas de Gortari used when he announced that the time for change had come in Mexico, that government monopolies and protectionist trade practices of the past would end. Instead of protection, there would be prosperity. And for a time, that hope became a reality. Foreign goods were available in abundance, and so was credit. Mexicans were buying and enjoying it. And so were foreign investors who flocked to the newly opened Mexican market. But the good times were short. On January 1st, 1994, the day the North American Free Trade Agreement went into effect, a peasant rebellion rose in the state of Chiapas to challenge Salinas' policies. In March, while campaigning in Tijuana, presidential candidate Luis Donaldo Colosio was assassinated. Foreigners and nationals began to fear that Mexico was not stable enough for their investments. The government of new Mexican president Ernesto Cedillo, hoping to quiet those fears, decided to let the free market determine the worth of the peso in December of 1994. The Mexican currency faltered, then fell to nearly half of its former value. The recession that followed has filled the front pages of our newspapers and those of the foreign press ever since. But in the midst of the public debate about the cause of the crisis, it is the Mexican people who have had to cope with its consequences. Like many in Mexico, Giselle Gonzalez and her husband decided to buy a new house and a new car during the good times before the crisis. The interest rate was then about 20%, but when the peso fell, their rate rose to about 110%. Giselle now visits her lawyer every month, looking for some way to manage her rapidly rising debts. As a result of the crisis, the Gonzaleses now owe twice the original value of their house and five times the value of their car. Our problem is that the monthly payments are very high. And at the same time, the principal is still generating interest. So how much time will it take for us to finish these payments if we continue the way we're going? About how much time will it take? 
de todas las opciones, la que más viable sería uh -huh. en un momento es eh, implementar With the options you've got, I think the best course would be to try to challenge this kind of one-sided increase in the interest rate. Thank you. I'm going to bring all the paperwork to see what you can do here. My pleasure, whatever I can do. Fine. Let's see what's best. Payment problems that Giselle faces are far from unique. Every afternoon in Mexico City, hundreds of new debtors come to an open meeting held by the Bar Association. Like Giselle, most of the people who attend could not have imagined coming to a meeting like this a year ago. Each new group brings the same questions. How much do I have to pay? Can I dispute the high interest rates? What will happen if I don't pay? Will I lose my business, my car, my house? The Gonzaleses married, bought a new home, and began a family during what Mexicans now call the blessed years. For both of them, the future seemed bright. Juan Pablo joined a weekly radio talk show in addition to his work at a political studies institute. Giselle began a freelance career as a worker training specialist. Their debts and the postponement of their hopes has made them and many of their countrymen frustrated with the pace of change in Mexico. I have to admit that when I was doing my commentaries at the radio station about a week ago, there was an unusual tone in the things I was saying. I was really very angry about the crisis, the way it came so quickly, and about the depth of the recession we're in. I was angry. How long will people put up with this? How long will they endure this government and their policies and the way they just crush us? I think that this is an enormous question, really. How much more has to happen before people get truly angry and do something? But the country and our society are changing, and this you can see with optimism. I can't think of any other way to look at it than as a process of change. There are many Mexicans who believe that we do have reasons to be optimistic if we take the long-term view. 1995 was not our first economic crisis, and it may not be our last. But our basic economic institutions not only survived, but matured. The World Bank recently determined that 75% of Mexico's wealth lay in our human resources, in the talents and labor of our citizens at every level of economic life. The street vendors and small businessmen that one sees everywhere in Mexico are vibrant symbols of that ingenuity. Their entrepreneurial spirit creates what experts here call the informal economy an untaxed, unregulated source of support for Mexico's working poor, and a cushion against the shock of hard times. One third of the Mexican people work in the informal economy. They live in neighborhoods like Chalco, on the outskirts of Mexico City. 12 years ago, this land was vacant, but as the poor overflow their old neighborhoods, they spill into Chalco. There are no phones, little transportation, and no sewers. When it rains, the water rises to the doorsteps of the makeshift houses. By 1995, there were over one million men, women, and children living here. Thank you. 
Maria Mendes is one of Chalco's first residents and one of its first entrepreneurs. Nearly a decade ago, she set up a business offering the one service that everyone here needed, daycare. Maria's primary goal was to work with children. But in order to keep her center alive and growing, she also needed to make a profit. The problems she faced were typical of the informal economy. No savings, no credit, no business skills. But Maria got help from a group that saw the potential for real economic growth in the enterprises of the poor. About eight years ago, we started this business of daycare for children with mothers who work. I decided to join CAME so that I could improve my center with loans that would help me buy more materials. CAME is a Spanish acronym that stands for the Center for the Support of Very Small Businesses. The members of CAME are organized in groups of 25. Maria's group has named itself the Universe of Stars. They meet every Saturday in her playroom. All of these women are already in business. They are here because they haven't been able to generate the capital they need to make their businesses grow. CAME is showing them how to get around that obstacle. Each member of the partnership makes a weekly deposit to the group's savings account. CAME matches the group's savings with its own funds. The joint account becomes an investment fund from which any member can get a loan if the group agrees that her business plan presents a sound risk for their money. The program is the brainchild of Alfredo Ubar, a businessman with a practical approach to informal economic development. As both borrowers and lenders, CAME groups constitute a mini-bank in a community where there are no banks. Pioneers of CAME, this is one of the groups that we are most proud of. Let's talk about some of the things that you should be considering. If you can't pay a loan of 2,000 pesos, you should take one for... Less. These are work groups. So we come here to work as a group. What happens if you have to resort to your savings to pay a loan? And if all of you pay your loans with your savings, then what will happen to the group? And if you don't have any money? Well, you may like each other, but you aren't coming here just to see each other's faces. Since CAME began working in 1994, it has formed 70 groups with more than 1,700 people, mostly women. The average savings of each member is 780 pesos, roughly $130. It may seem like a small sum, but the combined savings of all members amount to nearly a quarter of a million dollars. That kind of money can go a long way in a community like Chalco. Savings are something that are fundamental for Mexico's development. And our groups are generating savings for investments and jobs for their members. What really interests me in all of this is the creation of jobs. I've always been worried that there just weren't enough sources of work in Mexico. On market day, the muddy streets of Chalco are filled with small merchants who crop up everywhere in Mexico, looking for customers, ready to do business under any circumstances. CAME members have a repayment record of nearly 98%, a rate any banker would envy. It's a sign of how desperately the residents of Chalco want small loans and of how a small
multiply into a small fortune for thousands of individuals. Why do you need groups like CAME? Why don't your members just go to the traditional banks? They don't exist here. And well, there are two reasons. In Mexico, there are no popular financial systems on the one hand. And on the other, what CAME is trying to do is to generate employment. The people of Chalco are very hard working. Poor people have the same dignity and the same abilities as others. But what they need are opportunities. So that's our philosophy, that the people in our groups are professionals, no matter how modest their work may be. We don't treat them as poor people. We think of them as businessmen. While CAME trains entrepreneurs in Chalco, the technological institute, the tech, does the same thing in Monterrey, on a very different level. It is the most advanced educational institution in Mexico for engineers, managers and administrators. Dr. Rafael Rangel Sosman is the rector of the tech. Ideally, we look for a person who has intellectual ability, but particularly someone who has a sense of his community and wants to promote development for his country. I tell our students that today it's not enough to be an altruist. They have to be thinking about economic development. It's not enough to be an idealist. Today we have to make our students realize that the best way to develop our society is to create jobs, to create business, to create opportunities. We expect them to fulfill their responsibility by taking risks for their country. The Monterrey Tech was founded more than 50 years ago by local industrial leaders who wanted a first-rate engineering school, not just in Mexico but specifically designed to meet Mexico's business needs. I seriously question people who study literature, European literature, Russian literature. That's fine in developed countries which have so many resources that they can waste some on things like that. But Mexico doesn't have as many resources as the countries of the developed world. So, if we want Mexico to become wealthy, we have to create systems that create wealth. And these systems are called businesses. When we give a professional title to a boy, I feel that this title should mean that this young man has the qualities of a good employee, but also that this person should have the qualities of a good employer. We tell them, you have a responsibility, a very important responsibility to your country. Why? Because you are one of the few educated people who has the ability to bring real change to your country. Only 7% of Mexicans have college degrees. In June of 1995, Gabriel Perez became one of them, along with 800 of his classmates graduating with bachelor and advanced degrees. Gabriel's mother and father and much of the rest of the family have come to witness and record the graduation ceremony and to share in Gabriel's honor. From the day they arrive at the tech, the students are told that they represent Mexico's best, that on their graduation day, they will join in a long line of distinguished alumni. Fifteen Mexican senators are graduates of the tech, along with five governors. In fact, about 12% of all public officials in Mexico are tech alumni. Joining this club is a real cause for celebration. A tech degree comes with a firm sense of responsibility, a theme that is repeated throughout the rituals of the day. Graduates, have faith in Mexico, your parents, and the tech. Because the tech, Mexico, and your parents have faith in you.
And now, I would like to ask you to stand and take the protesta. The protesta, or oath, is the culmination of the graduation ceremony. Do you pledge that you will place the interests of your profession, your community, and your country over your own personal interests? You have accepted your oath. And now I congratulate you and wish you Godspeed and good luck. Are you going in order of age? I felt very emotional because at the graduation ceremony, we were aware that this was a critical moment in our lives. This very moment when we received our degrees. Once the diplomas were awarded, our lives would never be the same again. The week after his graduation, Gabriel began his first full-time job with his grandfather. With unemployment rising, he was one of the lucky few who had a job at all. In fact, out of my classmates in my major, I believe that only three or four of us already had work that was more or less secure. The rest, no. And they're very worried. Five members of Gabriel's family are co-owners of the business which his grandfather started as a stall on a street in Mexico City. The company was founded when I was 18 years old, 60 years ago. We built things from iron, shutters, doors, windows, gates, just about everything. But the business really took off when Gabriel's grandfather invented one of the most popular toys in Mexico. In looking for a name, we started with the idea of something that descends. Avalanches descend. The avalancha business was always seasonal, highly dependent on Christmas and Epiphany gift sales. But in 1995, the off-season became the whole season. Of the 100 employees who once manned this factory, only 10 remained, kept on in the hope of new orders. When you go through a crisis like this, when you hit bottom, when the job opportunities aren't so good, and then some little option opens, you say, well, I'll take it. And then you start to like it and think, well, this is fine. There are things I can do here, things that I can contribute. I can help here by continuing with the family tradition. Family businesses are an old tradition in Mexico. Some say that as many as 90% of all Mexican businesses are owned by families. Even the Technological Institute was started by a family, the Garza Sadas, the same family that made Monterrey the industrial heart of Mexico. The centerpiece of their empire is the Cuauhtémoc Brewery. Okay, we're going to start on this side. I'm going to tell you the story. I'm going to ask you to be quiet so everyone can hear. The Cuauhtémoc Moctezuma Brewery began in 1890, that is, 105 years ago. A long time ago, really. It started with a brand they called, and still call, Carta Blanca. It started with a simple idea, to sell beer to hot, thirsty travelers arriving from the northern desert. But as the business grew, the Garza Sadas needed more and more bottles. Rather than import them, the family set up their own glassworks. When American businesses started selling their products in Mexico, Vidriera Monterrey was already there, ready to convert 
into any new shape. But the bottles also needed caps. Rather than import them, the Garza Sada set up their own steelworks. With time, this factory also began supplying the heavy industry of Mexico. The Monterrey Group succeeded because they found a way to be both Mexican and international. And in Mexico, competing internationally means crossing one border above all others. It's the longest border between a first and third world country in the world, 2,000 miles, and every day a brisk trade passes over it, bringing profit to both sides. Still, the connection between these two countries caused one Mexican president to say, poor Mexico, so far from God, and so close to the United States. Mexican businesses have long had mixed feelings about the American giant. The United States is physically five times bigger than Mexico, and its economy 20 times larger than our own. Such inequality of size and wealth can be very intimidating and very enticing to those who want to connect to that immense market. The United States consumes three quarters of Mexico's exports, about $38 billion worth of goods every year, while two thirds of our imports come from the US. The principal trading lines out of Mexico lead to Texas, to Houston, Texas. It's not surprising that this city should be among our most important trading partners. One of their most important businesses is also our biggest export. The number one item traded with Mexico out of the port of Houston is oil, and all the things that are made from oil. But if Americans think business when they think oil, Mexicans think history. The tie between Mexican oil and American business goes back to the first year of this century, when an American businessman first found oil near Tampico, Mexico. By the early 1920s, Mexican wells were producing half a million barrels a day. But after the Mexican Revolution, the new government required that foreign companies hire 90% of their workers in Mexico. When the oil workers went on strike for higher wages and benefits, their cause became a political and patriotic issue. On March 18, 1938, President Lázaro Cárdenas announced the nationalization of Mexican oil. Though the move was condemned in the United States as socialist thievery, it was enormously popular in Mexico, where citizens line up to pay for the foreign assets with their jewelry their silver plate, and their personal savings. Petróleos Mexicanos, Pemex, was created as a state-run monopoly. After more than half a century, it is still the only enterprise entitled to produce, refine, and distribute oil products in Mexico. Pemex now ranks as the largest corporation in Mexico. In fact, it's the largest corporation in all of Latin America and the sixth largest oil producer in the world. To most Mexicans, oil is a symbol of economic strength and national sovereignty. But in order for oil to serve either purpose, Pemex has to compete in the international arena. In the Houston office of Pemex, Felipe Luna is the president of its subsidiary, PMI Holdings North America. Mexico is a very significant supplier of heavy crude oils. Heavy crude oil is a crude which is difficult to refine, and generally heavy crudes command, a, because of their qualities, command a lower uh, price relative to lighter crudes. Of the three types of oil Mexico produces, the one it has in the greatest abundance, Maya crude from the Gulf of Campeche, 
is too heavy to refine easily into the one product that Mexico and the rest of the world wants most, gasoline. In 1990, Pemex went looking for a better price and a better product from their Maya crude. At the same time, back in Houston, American oil companies were trying to keep all refineries in step with an increasingly competitive market. Shell Oil was one of many with the same problem. The business of refining is to take crude oil in its raw form, that is either of your own production in your own company or purchased from others, and to transform that crude oil into the products that are desired in the marketplace, gasoline, home heating oils, uh, turbine fuel. It's an increasingly tough business in an increasingly global market. And as Shell then looked at its refining network, and specifically the Deer Park refining venture, it, it realized that it had to do something in order to improve its competitiveness. It's a business that involves huge volumes and very, very thin profit margin, pennies, pennies per gallon, very few pennies per gallon, in fact. The tankers that dock at Shell's Deer Park refinery carry light, expensive crude. But if Deer Park could be converted to refined, cheaper, heavy crude, then Shell and Pemex would have a solution to both of their problems and the beginnings of a deal. If you were going to make a substantial investment, you want to be sure that the heavy crude is going to be there every day. On a steady basis, the same crude day in, day after, so you get efficient processing that crude. And the right supply for this project was Maya crude. Pemex wanted a secure outlet for their heavy crude oil. Uh, they wanted a, a secure supply of, of unleaded gasoline importation back into Mexico. And what could be more reliable than a refinery where you have an equity interest? The Mexican market is demanding and growing. Mexican drivers consume more gasoline than Pemex produces. A partnership with an American refinery would help Pemex fill that demand at home while creating a demand for their crude oil abroad. Petróleos Mexicanos and Shell Oil started getting serious in 1992. The first thing that you have to have is a commitment that what you want to put together is a long-term relationship. Kind of like a courtship leading up to an engagement. Like a marriage between two companies. Two people, maybe in their late 30s, marrying their high school sweetheart, right? It's a very unique kind of an arrangement. And, uh, and getting two companies the size of Shell and Pemex to do something like this uh, where you have to be uh, quick on your feet and very aggressive. This is something really different. Hemex and Shell went to the altar in April of 1993 when ground was broken for the new upgraded refinery at Deer Park, Texas. Last night I went to a concert of a musician I admire, a fellow named Lyle Lovett. And Lyle has a new song. Uh, and it goes, uh, I can tell you're not from Texas, but Texas wants you anyway. <laughs> and as I was sitting there this morning, I was thinking how true that is uh, of our friends from Mexico, that we can tell you're not from Texas, but Texas wants you anyway. The Deer Park joint venture gave Pemex a market for 140,000 barrels a day of Maya crude, gave Mexico 35,000 barrels a day of unleaded gasoline, gave Houston jobs, gave Texas tax revenues, and gave both Shell and Pemex an upgraded refinery without putting either company in any debt. The joint venture financed the $1 billion project with a bond issue that was snapped up by private investors. We courted other girls, okay? We are very pleased to, uh, to be married to the one we chose. <laughs> the key to Mexico's future is finding ways to begin again keeping our past and building on it, too. Within our country, there are still people who live and work as they have for centuries. More than 7,000 years ago, corn was born in Mexico. 
fields of corn were passed down from one generation to the next throughout the Mexican South, as here in Puebla. We built our cities where there was corn nearby. It became the basis of our culture. And corn is still part of a complex traditional life that we respect and sometimes even revere in Mexico as one part of our national identity. One quarter of the Mexican people live in the countryside, and just about all of them are poor. Many of the trades they practice were here when the Spaniards came in the 16th century. Little has changed for them. Children pick up the skills of their fathers at a young age and continue until they are also old men. The value of the work is held high, but there is little profit in it. With quick hands, a man can make six baskets a day. Each basket goes for about five pesos, less than a dollar. How was your work before? The same as now. They say it was worse. It was worse. They paid less. Now they pay a bit more money. But we still have to go to Tehuacan at two in the morning, walking next to the burrow, loaded with baskets, over the hills. For 30 pesos a day, I could make more if I worked to eight or nine at night. If I was willing to do some extra. It's the same for you too, huh? You work a little more to get a little more. Everything's a business. I know that, even though I can't read. But I enjoy my life. Very few country people ever abandon the traditional way of life. The bonds of costume and the constraints of poverty are too hard to break. The culture of small crafts and corn cultivation pervades southern Mexico and keeps it impoverished. The irony is that corn does not grow well in its birthplace without fertilizer or irrigation. And in the south, there is little of either. But in Mexico's Pacific Northwest, in the state of Sinaloa, we have both. The farmland here lies on a fertile plain between the ocean and the Sierra Madre. Mountain streams provide water to large land holdings dedicated to commercial crops. On nearly three million acres of arable land, farmers produce more than nine million tons of grains, vegetables, and fruit every year. Sinaloa accounts for almost one quarter of Mexico's total agricultural export. Mangoes and melons for the Asian and North American market, tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers for the American winter market, corn and wheat for Africa and Latin America. It's the most advanced agriculture in Mexico, often compared with California's Imperial Bali, and it's very profitable. But it could be even more profitable if the Mexican transportation system could deliver the nation's produce more quickly. The farmers of Sinaloa use trucks almost exclusively, 
even though this means their produce has to take a 700-mile journey up the west coast of Mexico to the U.S. border, where it then begins an even longer journey to its ultimate customer. Though it is not a very efficient system, the growers have little choice. Few would risk their produce or their profits on the government-owned railroad service, where shipments get delayed, get lost, or wind up on a hot siding for days. But in 1995, the government announced that nearly all of its rail services would be privatized, either sold outright or leased as long-term concessions. That move opened the possibility for real improvement. Mexican businessman Rafael Fernandez MacGregor sees the privatization effort as an opportunity to give the farmers of Sinaloa a more direct link to their American customers. A transportation specialist, Fernandez MacGregor believes the Chihuahua Pacific Line, running through the Sierra Madre Mountains, can be converted into an effective freight line. This day, he took his nine-year-old son, Andres, along for the ride. Fernandez MacGregor has joined a group of North American investors who want to buy the line and connect it to one they have already purchased between the Mexican border and Dallas, Texas. If they win the bidding, the international group will have created an international rail service, something Mexico hasn't had for decades. beginning of this century, when the railroads were the most important single tool for national economic development and growth, sovereignty and railroads were very closely linked. The railroads were reserved for the government. Therefore, you didn't have entrepreneurs uh, trying to do something in the railroads and, and going down a learning curve uh, in that industry. So all of a sudden now, you have privatization of the concessions cooperate and that's a problem because the people that do have that expertise tend to be foreign railroads. Fernandez MacGregor brings to this new venture a sense of what Mexico has to offer and what it has yet to learn in transportation technology. The son of a Mexican diplomat, Fernandez MacGregor spent much of his childhood in the United States, picking up English and a bicultural perspective. We were always moving from country to country, living in new places. It helps you understand different cultures. It, it of course, helps you learn a language before you're 12 and therefore you're able to assimilate it more or less. That's the type of thing that I, I think about in educating my kids. I think the opportunity of growing up in two different cultures is absolutely crucial. It makes an entrepreneurial career much, much easier. Understanding the strengths and the needs of two cultures may be the key to making this railroad service work. The Mexican rail system lost practically half of its market share of overland transportation within the last 10 years. Service wasn't very good, reliability wasn't very good, and we in the trials have proven that we can reduce the transit time for a perishable by two and a half to three days, say to Chicago, and reduce the cost of freight by 17%. That's a very, very significant advantage. That opens markets that may not have been accessible before. The Chihuahua Pacific was designed as a shortcut from Texas to the Pacific Ocean by American railroad promoters in 1875. But for more than 50 years, the Sierra Madre Mountains defeated them. In 1940, its last American owner turned the line over to the Mexican government. It took them 20 years to lay 400 miles of track and cut 87 tunnels through the cliffs and canyons of the Sierra Madre. How could they have built a railroad in such a desolate place, some place where there's practically nothing? They built it somewhere else. 
What do you mean, somewhere else? They built it somewhere else and brought it here. <laughs> the rails, yes. And the wood for the ties. But they had to cut through the mountain. And build the tunnels. That part was easy. With dynamite. Yes, they had to use a lot of dynamite. When they began building this part from Creel to Loreto, they got opinions from railroad experts, engineers from as far away as Japan and France. Every one of them thought it was a crazy dream to build a train through these mountains. But Francisco Togno, a Mexican engineer from Tijuana, showed that we weren't so crazy. There's a story that Togno chose the route for the train with the help of a mule. She let the mule free in the mountains, then followed him. A mule will always find the easiest way to go anywhere. And they say that this is how Togno chose the route. There's a deeply emotional part of it, romanticism, the history of it. This was an adventure of epic proportions for the people that had the vision and the guts to go at it and the persuasive capabilities to, to, you know, to convince people to put their money and their effort behind this. And in those little towns we stopped at where 50 or 60 people came on, that's the only way to get there from here. It's so vitally important. We must find a way for that to continue. The Chihuahua Pacific Railroad is one of the few classic rail journeys left in the world. Preserving it by making it work for all of its customers is one of Fernandez MacGregor's goals. Though it steadily loses money, it has no shortage of passengers. 250,000 tourists come every year drawn by its classic landscapes Indian villages and its centerpiece, the spectacular Copper Canyon. More than four times the size of America's Grand Canyon, it's one of Mexico's great natural treasures. In going through the Copper Canyon, I try not to fall under the spell of, of its beauty. You have to retain a detached view of, of, of this business. It was an extraordinary expression of national pride when it was uh, completed. Unfortunately, those things alone will not carry it. Those things alone won't ensure that, that this line will be here 50 years from now. You have to look at the fundamentals of what will ensure that this will continue to provide opportunities for the communities along it, because that's the only way it can survive. Mexico is going through tough economic times, but we've gone through these things before. We should have learned our lesson by now. But uh, we tend to come out of them. We're sure that we'll come out in a couple of years. So if you look at the fundamentals, you look at the long-term view, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for big players and for small players like ourselves. got all sorts of Mexicos in this country and I believe that uh, integrating all those Mexicos is, is really the objective here. Pulling up the Mexicos that are at the bottom of that chain is the challenge for the country and, and getting all those Mexicos to talk and understand each other's needs is what, what it's all about. That's, that's, our, that's our challenge. And that's our ultimate goal, making change an opportunity, a reality for all Mexicans. Emerging Powers is supported by IBM. And by the Ford Motor Company.
where quality is job one. With additional funding provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the annual financial support of viewers like you.